let's get going. Um, so welcome everybody to this um, CSDMS webinar. Um, today, I'm really thrilled to um, introduce um, Dr. Tristan Saul from the University of Sydney. Um, those of you who know Tristan's work will know that he is an absolute pioneer in coupled modeling of landscapes and seascapes, what's happening onshore and what's happening in the stratigraphic record, and most recently a pioneer of both modeling surface processes in biodiversity and global landscape evolution modeling. So I think he's going to tell us uh, something about some of those things things at least. Um, and so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Tristan for Landscape Dynamics Dictate the Evolution of Biodiversity on Earth. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Greg. And thanks for the invitation. So let me try to share my screen. Um, let's go. I will get rid of all the Zoom thing. Um, I put in good. Okay, so can you all hear me? Yes? I can't see you now because I get rid of all the things, but I will say, we'll take a no answer for a yes then. Uh, so yeah, so thank you for having me. Uh, I didn't realize that it was going to be 1 a.m. Uh, in Sydney where, where I'm sitting now, but uh, that's what happens when you are not really organized. So so, so that's, that's fine. Uh, I'm awake. Uh, so I'm going to talk, as Greg was uh, mentioning about... Uh, uh, some of the recent work we've been doing, looking at uh, global scale uh, landscape evolution model and trying to make some uh, links uh, between uh, what we learn from this uh, from this simulation and the evolution of of life. Um, and so this work basically we've been uh, developing the code for several years, and we start to make or some outputs now that we can. Uh, that we can tell something about uh, uh, since maybe a, a, a bit more than a year now. Um, so uh, I guess I'm, I've got like a, some uh, introductory uh, slides here. Pretty much everyone is going to be aware of it, but uh, I start with it. I took this uh, this idea of uh, the analogy with the uh, with the human uh, with the human body from my. Uh, I think I read it in in one post from John Perron, and I really liked it. So uh, I, I, I took it for myself. And so basically the idea that the Earth's surface is the living skin of our planet. And um, and this this surface is basically uh, uh, at the interface between uh, two main processes, so place tectonics uh, and surface processes. And by surface processes, uh, I'm specifically going to look at uh, uh, the effect of uh, water uh, and gravity, and not really uh, talking about uh, wind and uh, and and ice, uh, but here you've got two examples of this uh, of this uh, uh, effect of this of this uh, uh, plate and and surface process plate tectonic and surface processes with uh, uh, the Himalaya mountain on the left and uh, uh, the Lena Delta in uh, Russia, um, and so really. Uh, when we when we what 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 I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, basically uh, what uh, we can learn from this model uh, specifically uh, when we think about biodiversity uh, and I could not have started I guess this uh, this this presentation without uh, uh, this beautiful diagram from uh, von Anbold, uh from the mid 19th centuries where already like this idea of relationship between uh, landscape, geology, uh, and species distribution and diversity um, uh, is is well is well illustrated, uh, and so this idea is coming back from you know uh, several uh, centuries, uh, but uh, still we are you know not able to uh, really uh, integrate that in a kind of a modeling framework, and we are working mostly qualitatively uh, towards understanding this thing. So. Uh, specifically, uh, what the question I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask is uh, why uh, do we see areas where we've got uh, on the on the Earth's surface where we've got a lot of biodiversity, where uh, and also how did basically uh, the Earth's surface environments have uh, potentially changed uh, the course of biodiversity and life on Earth. Uh, 
in many of the approaches that have been used uh, in the past, uh, most of the time people have been looking at landscape uh, as a kind of a steady, uh, 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 steady thing, so a st stable geomorphic features, and uh, and in and especially when people have been looking at landscape in deep time, uh, they have considered that that this uh, this landscape is is pretty much static. Um, in reality, uh, and most, um, you know, uh, pretty much every geomorphologist knows that uh, this is a dynamic uh, system and that uh, it can evolve really rapidly and change, uh, you know, and it's transient by, nat by nature. <laughs> so in this talk, I'm going to uh, basically uh, have two main components. The first one is going to be uh, talking about uh, how we could uh, improve on paleogeography reconstruction uh, using uh, some landscape evolution models. So here, I really like the the idea is that what I'm going to present is uh, is still work in progress. Uh, there is a, a lot of things that could be uh, done to make better prediction or better uh, better reconstruction, uh, but it gives you an idea of uh, potentially what can be done. So that would be the first part. And then after I've got a second part, uh, which is more related to what can we learn from these models in terms of uh, the interaction between uh, the Earth surface uh, and uh, and uh, and biodiversity. So let's start with the, the first part. So the reconstruction and trying to uh, define and build a tool uh, to basically do some quantitative uh, 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 approach to simulate uh, these paleogeographies. Uh, so when we when we think about uh, Earth's past landscape, uh, usually we we are dealing with map like uh, this one, so the one on the on the left here, which basically uh, are created uh, from like uh, uh, looking, for example, at analogs, but uh, looking at present day and trying to make some inference from that. Uh, also uh, based on plate reconstruction, pl plate tectonics reconstruction, and also of course, based on a, a lot of geological data. So uh, it could be fossil records, it could be stratigraphy. Um, but usually what we end up with is, is a map like this, where you've got uh, over time uh, pretty much like kind of polygons uh, with a mountain range. For example, here in orange, you will have like a mountain range uh, that forms and potentially disappear over time. Um, and this, this, uh, this paleogeography, they are uh, relatively scarce and, and for uh, people working with landscape evolution models, um, you know, they, there is not enough uh, complexity in this landscape to really be useful uh, uh, for, for, for us. Uh, you've got on the, on the right, um, an example which is a bit more uh, refined in terms of texture of the surface. Uh, this is uh, uh, some proprietary uh, software where you can have this kind of, uh, of, of data and you can see how basically uh, they use different uh, drilling sites, uh, different fossil records to try to infer the position of the elevation over time. And on this specific one here, they've got also some kind of representation of the main drainage system. Um, and so uh, this, you know, in both cases, basically, th this map, they are uh, relatively uh, uh, coarse, and in terms of resolution, they, they don't really have a lot of information. Uh, but anyway, they are mostly, they are used a lot by the community, uh, speci specifically to reconstruct uh, atmospheric and oceanic, oceanic uh, climates, uh, and also to uh, understand, like, the uh, the distribution of natural resources on the surface of the Earth, uh, but also used for uh, evaluating the evolution of life. So when people are uh, dealing with uh, uh, with um, uh, me uh, meta community models, so models of uh, uh, representation of the competition between species at macro scale, basically, uh, they will rely on these maps uh, to basically build their models. So our idea was, uh, uh, can we move from this uh, kind of uh, qualitative understanding uh, or maybe not move from that, but can we uh, use some tool uh, to uh, see how well uh, this, uh, this qualitative uh, 
uh, representation of the of the earth uh, how far they are from from potentially the the reality and so uh, what we try to do is to design a tool uh, to be able to test uh, these paleogeographies so the idea was uh, uh, okay we we have some understanding of uh, how we should uh, simulate basically uh, the evolution of the geomorphology of the earth um, you know what we do what we usually do as a as a as a landscape evolution modeler we will uh, uh, take a specific uh, specific region uh, we will uh, get some idea about the the, the precipitation uh, the tectonics of the of the region, and then after we will uh, have a, a guess on the initial um, uh, on the initial surface and run a model forwards in time and look at the evolution of the erosion and deposition. Um, and our idea was to do exactly that, but for like a, a, instead of working at catchment or regional scale, to uh, upscale that to a global scale. So here you've got. Uh, on the top here, a paleoclimate models, uh, a so which depicts the, the rainfall, I guess. Um, you've got some tectonic, and in our case, we are uh, dealing, uh, we are not, we are uh, accounting for uh, uh, dynamic topography. Um, and uh, we can combine the two on an initial uh, paleogeography and run our landscape evolution model, get an idea of the amount of erosion and deposition. Uh, and also on the geomorphic uh, evolution of the system. Uh, so to, to, to do that, basically, we use a, 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 a relatively standard model, uh, which basically will account for change in elevation uh, as a function of uplift, uh, erosion deposition induced by rivers, and uh, ill slope processes. So something which is uh, uh, really standard, you all know about that so far, uh, the erosion for the erosion rate we will we use um, we use a stream power law, uh, and we've got a vertical deposition rate which is uh, dependent on sediment flux versus the water flux, uh, and so really like the the main advance I guess uh, in what we've been uh, uh, doing is basically uh, trying to develop. Uh, uh, ways of uh, running these models on uh, supercomputers uh, to be able to uh, get like relatively high resolution at global scale. And when I say high, uh, we are talking, I think the two, the two, um, uh, the two model or the two simulation I'm going to show, uh, one is run at 10 kilometer resolution globally and the other one at, at five kilometer. And to do that, we had to work a bit on, on how we, uh, basically solve this this equation here and uh, uh, usually when uh, when usually when people are developing landscape evolution models they will uh, pretty much uh, design their tool around like a kind of a graph the theory because like the the river networks they lend the, they, they lend themselves quite well uh, uh, in this kind of uh, of of uh, graph uh, uh, graph theory and what we did here was to use a matrix based approach to be able to leverage on some existing tools that uh, act that uh, that basically can uh, uh, be used over like a multiple processor and are quite quite fast to solve so we, we rely heavily on uh, on petsy uh, in, in our in our model uh, and so the name of the model is called gospel there is nothing religious here is basically go spl um, and uh, and the approach that is used is really like a standard evolution, uh, standard landscape evolution model. So you will give as input a set of uh, of uh, of parameters, so the elevation, uh, climate, tectonic, and you will get uh, as a result of your model a series of outputs that will be that you could use to uh, to investigate landscape dynamics. Uh, but also river what, uh, uh, water and sediment flux from rivers. Um, and also you've got the ability to uh, uh, store stratigraphic uh, uh, layers over time. And so you can potentially reconstruct a, a basin evolution. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, like uh, in any other models, uh, you will uh, test uh, your initial input uh, versus empirical data and potentially have to uh, 
to basically loop back and forth between the, between these inputs uh, and the empirical data based on the output you've generated. Uh, so Gospel in itself is um, is initially tailored for uh, global uh, simulation, uh, but can be used also at a regional or even catchment scale uh, if if uh, if people are, are are willing to do this at at this scale. Um, so in terms of uh, of paleogeography, uh, here you've got at the top like a different sketch of uh, one of the highest resolution paleo elevation models. So that's the one from uh, Scotties and White 2018. Uh, you've got here the north uh, north of South America, uh, the northern Atlantic with the US and uh, and uh, I guess a bit of Africa here. Uh, and here, this is the uh, East uh, African Rift. And uh, what uh, we can do with the model is basically uh, run uh, for a set of uh, specific uh, precipitation and tectonic forcing, uh, run the model and look at uh, how this, uh, this specific landscape is going to be uh, dissected uh, by surface processes. So you can see here, for example, you've got the Andes. Uh, that's what the paleogeography is, provi is, 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 is looking, uh, and that's after you run your, your landscape evolution model. So, and you can see that in different uh, region here. Um, and the idea is that uh, what we believe uh, uh, is important is specifically if you are looking at uh, a species uh, evolution and how uh, some species are going to adapt in different region, uh, the, the fact that you can account for uh, some complexity uh, in the landscape, for example, this uh, deep inside valley that you can see uh, here, uh, that will that will potentially have a, have a, a huge impact on this on this distribution of of, uh, of biodiversity. So to uh, run these models, actually, if we look at the top and the uh, at the top image and the and the bottom one, uh, what we do here, we are actually running the model uh, for a specific time interval. So let's say we are at 150 million years. Uh, we are going to uh, basically run the model with a set of, uh, of uh, rainfall condition and, uh, and tectonic up to the point where we reach a, a, dynamic, a dynamic equilibrium. And once we reach this dynamic equilibrium, basically we'll consider that this landscape is representative of uh, the specific time slice that we are looking at. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, ipsometric curve, if we compare the two, uh, the two landscapes there, the top one and the bottom one, uh, they've got pretty much the same distribution. What changed is basically the fact that we are integrating in uh, this uh, bottom maps here more a bit more complexity uh, in the landscape. But overall, they, uh, relate, they match themselves in terms of distribution of elevation range. So this approach, uh, which consists in basically uh, running the model for a given period of time until we reach a, a kind of a dynamic equilibrium, is a, is an approach that we uh, that is routinely used uh, for paleoclimate models. So usually, what they will do, they will have a, a specific landscape, um, and they will uh, uh, have some inputs. I don't know. Let's say. Uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, a specific uh, uh, volume of water, uh, and they will basically run their model until they reach uh, a, a kind of steady state, and they will consider that also as representative of their of the of the atmospheric and oceanic climate for a given uh, time. And so we we basically use the same approach here, but to simulate the, the landscape evolution. So with this model, what we can do is basically uh, create like and this I think this is uh, yeah I think this is five kilometer resolution model. So we can run at different time slices. Um, uh, the what we should expect in terms of uh, of change in the in the uh, morphology of the landscape, but also we've got information and that's what you see here uh, superimposed on this landscape is basically you've got the drainage network. Uh, the large uh, places, which are like kind of teal blue here, they correspond to places where you've got uh, uh, some uh, uh, depression in your landscape. So you, 
you it might be lakes or it might be just like a, a really a flat uh, region we don't really incorporate at the moment uh, uh, any evapotranspiration laws in our, in our model so so i will not I, I will tend not to think that all these things are lakes uh, they might just be a dry lands and really a flat lands so what we do is we we can run these models uh, like this over time uh, and get an idea of the distribution of the flow uh, network over time, but also like uh, as any landscape evolution model, we can also look at, uh, and that's what you've got here on the, on the right, is you've got the distribution of uh, erosion deposition rates. Uh, and, uh, and so you can basically uh, start to integrate these things over time. Uh, and uh, and ev and evaluate the the evolution over several hundred of uh, million years of uh, of your of your of your surface, and you can try to quantitatively test basically how your surface is uh, is responding to this tectonic and climatic forces. Um, and so here I put this here because I think this is a good uh, uh, thing to note to say, to really pinpoint the fact that this is not like a uh, there is still a lot of work uh, to do. So the way we we basically in all the models I'm going to uh, to present here, the way we are calibrating our model is basically we use present day uh, uh, present day um, uh, condition uh, and look at present day denudation rate and use that to calibrate our coefficient of erodibility in the stream power law. Once we have calibrated this uh, coefficient of erodibility, which is in our case uniform over the uh, entire surface of the globe, uh, once it's calibrated, we basically don't change the erodibility coefficient and assume that this is the same value for like, the duration of the simulation. So here, for example, for the, uh, you know, we look at the entire Phanerozoic, we basically calibrate our erodibility at this stage, and then after we don't touch at present at present day, and then after we don't touch it for for the entire duration. Uh, saying that, uh, it's not a, a technological uh, problem. If we wanted, I mean, and there is a capability in Gospel to actually have different maps with different erodibility. Uh, as well as the capability to change erodibility coefficient over time. Uh, the problem is that uh, we, we, we don't have a lot of information uh, to constrain this erodibility parameter over like deep time. Um, but uh, you know, like uh, we, in the future, that's something that uh, we, we would like, uh, we would like uh, to do uh, a bit better. Uh, but here, so what you've got is, uh, uh, in black here, you've got our, uh, the denudation rate, uh, which is predicted by the model. And uh, if we want to compare it with some data, we've got uh, like here some data from uh, Wilkinson based on uh, Wilkinson and McEnroe, uh, Elroy, um, uh, based on the stratigraphic record. Uh, and uh, for uh, close to the neogene uh, or present day, we've got uh, uh, data which is uh, available, which there is a bit more data that is available, so uh, which help us to calibrate a bit better the, the model, uh, you know, on this uh, first uh, uh, 20 million years. <laughs> but we see that there is periods where, uh, in terms of trend, for example, for the last 200 million years, uh, overall, the stratigraphic record is, is predicting like a, an increase, uh, which is also fine here. We see that uh, during that time here, uh, you know, between the Ordovician and the Triassic, there is, there is a huge difference between the, what you can expect from the stratigraphic record and, and what the model is predicting. What we think is that uh, as further uh, back in time you go, uh, the less re reliable um, the stratigraphic record is because you've got like, uh, the, of the surface processes have this tendency to to uh, erase basically uh, previous history uh, as as you progress in time. Um, so here here is basically uh, one of our uh, model over the last hundred million years where uh, we use the Scotty's uh, paleo elevation maps. Uh, we use the uh, paleoclimate, uh, and, and in this case, we will use only this rainfall, uh, which has been run on these paleo maps. Uh, and we uh, basically run our model 
Uh, and this time, instead of uh, waiting for the dynamic equilibrium to uh, be reached, we run this model uh, continuously. So what we do is we run this model over 5 million years. We test our model against the next paleo map uh, from Scotty's. We look at the mismatch between the two and we basically loop back and forth during this 5 million years interval uh, to uh, make our model match as uh, much as, as as best as possible with uh, the next uh, paleo uh, geographies. So what it allows us to do is basically to have a kind of a continuous evolution uh, of the of the of the landscape, um, and uh, we can after use this and start to look at how basically uh, uh, based on the paleo maps that we use how well we are able to reconstruct some of the stratigraphic uh, record. So to give you an idea of what we can do, we can, uh, for example, map uh, the different catchment over time. Uh, we can look uh, at the size of this catchment. Uh, we can look also at the amount of water which is uh, flowing uh, to the outlet. And here, uh, again, I'm taking, I guess, this analogy with the uh, human body. Uh, uh, me by saying that like the rivers, uh, in this case, they will correspond to the circulatory system uh, of the earth surface. So they will basically drain uh, uh, or transport sediments from the source to the sink, which is the, the ocean or, or like uh, endoric basins. Um, and what we can do is really try to map uh, how this, uh, how this circulator circulatory system is, is working. Um, and uh, even though the model is, is global, the idea is that uh, you can interrogate your model uh, for specific uh, places. And that's why we try to, to get a, a resolution. So in this case, it was 10 kilometers, uh, uh, which is uh, relatively high. Uh, is so we can basically say, OK, I want to know what my model is predicting, for example, for the uh, Orange River. Uh, in, uh, in South Africa. And so what we do is we will map basically the outlet of this, based on our model, the outlet of this uh, of the Orange River over time. And we will look at the amount of sediment which is flowing uh, through this outlet. And so here you've got like the results for this, uh, for this simulation here where you've got in orange uh, the simulated uh, sediment volume out out of the out of the out of the Orange River, and you got uh, in till here the measured uh, sediment volume. So overall, the model is is working uh, all right. We've got like this big pulse uh, in sediment, um, which is which correspond to the first uplift of the South African plateau around like uh, 95 to 80 million years. Then after you've got a period where there is pretty much nothing happening. And in our case, there is a second or renew uh, phase of, of, uh, of sediment uh, increase, uh, which is happening uh, you know, by 20 MA to, to present. Based on the measured uh, values, it seems that it's happening a bit uh, later and the intensity is not that uh, uh, high, but what the idea is that we can start to use this model uh, to say, okay, if we are really convinced that the values that are provided uh, from the uh, estimates from the uh, basically this 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 measure value here, they are estimates uh, based on the amount of sediment which is deposited on the mar on the margin. Um, so if we are if if we if we are if, if we are sure about about these values, we can start to. To, to test how we should uh, change the paleogeography uh, to make it fit better uh, with, uh, with the, the, the data that we've got. So in terms of output, uh, I mentioned the, the, the catchment uh, that we, we are able to, to evaluate. Uh, of course, we've got erosion and deposition and mentioned that as well. And for this specific hundred years of uh, hundred million years of evolution, uh, we recorded as well the stratigraphy. Uh, and so, what you've got access to is basically a global uh, stratigraphic map, uh, which is uh, I think it's uh, uh, you've got one stratigraphic layer for every million years. So you should have about like hundred 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 layers here. Uh, 
uh, you've got access to the stratigraphic. So in the stratigraphic layer, you've got access to the sediment thickness uh, for this specific for any specific uh, time interval of one million year, and also uh, uh, the porosity, uh, which is just based on a simple uh, 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 law. Uh, so if I go to the to the to some of this cross section. Uh, yeah, I took like the South America, the South America, uh, South of South America. Uh, and so basically you can, if you want, like uh, uh, make a slice anywhere in your model and look at what the model is predicting in terms of, uh, of stratigraphic uh, layers and also the, the structure of the stratigraphy. So you've got an example here where section one here is on the uh, Patagonian shelf where you've got like really thin, elongated uh, layers that are deposited. You can see here, here, we are more like around the northern part of the section where you've got a, uh, one huge uh, uh, continental basin, which is a Colorado basin. Uh, you've got another example here where we cross from the Andes uh, on the west uh, to uh, basically uh, the deep, uh, deep South Atlantic uh, 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 margin. And where you can see, like for example, the Salado Basin, and here's the Pelotas Basin, where you can potentially use some existing data uh, as we looked into before with the Orange River. You can, for example, look at seismic uh, seismic uh, uh, lines. You've got a bunch in the in the region, uh, and look at how your model compares with the prediction uh, in terms of. Uh, 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 thickness of the deposits uh, and how well it's able to reproduce, you know, some of the different slides. One place where it's relatively interesting is like this uh, section three here, uh, which cross uh, north, uh, which basically go from the north to the south. Uh, <coughs> so you've got the, the north here and, and the south there. Uh, and what we see from our model is that uh, we've got like an initial uh, uh, part where this Colorado Basin and Salado Basin, they are actually connected. And this is really uh, uh, induced by the initial paleotopography that we use. Uh, and uh, we had to wait uh, for uh, like uh, half of the simulation, so about like 50 to uh, 40 million, year, uh, million years ago, to start to have like the uh, kind of a late surrection, which corresponds to uh, a uh, 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 mountain range here, which is called the Tandia uh, High. Uh, so if we compare what the model is predicting with uh, some uh, uh, seismic interpretation, we see that the model is actually predicting that this mountain range here is actually happening uh, quite late uh, in the paleogeography. And we can say that because when we look at the stratigraphic record, it really differs significantly from what we see from the seismic. So our idea is that potentially we can use uh, this type of, uh, of simulation to, uh, um, to uh, change a bit the paleogeography uh, and potentially have this uh, uh, Tandilia heights that happen a bit uh, earlier uh, in the reconstruction. So this shows basically an idea of how you could uh, use uh, this uh, this simulation to improve on the paleo uh, geographies that are uh, that are available uh, so to conclude on this uh, specific uh, part here uh, what we are able to do is we are able to uh, use uh, this model to potentially give a bit more uh, a quantitative metrics on the evolution of the of the paleo geography uh, and uh, and use this model to improve on existing uh, paleogeography records. <coughs> so now I'm going to talk about uh, about the second part, which is like how what we can learn from this model in terms of uh, of evolution of life. Um, so if I go back to like the first uh, simulation that I show, which was like over the entire Phanerozoic, what we did was uh, looking at the uh, uh, at the position and the uh, amount of uh, water and sediments that was flowing uh, out of the uh, continent. So here, what you've got mapped is basically uh, the major uh, river outputs, uh, which are flowing uh, to uh, the ocean. 
So what we did was uh, uh, getting the uh, total sediment flux that was going out in the ocean. So that will correspond to these uh, 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 circles, like purplish circle that you see, and also map uh, basically places where we've got sediment which accumulates uh, on continent. So that will be the, the red uh, uh, areas on these maps. So if we uh, look at how this evolved over time, uh, we've got in blue, this is the total erosion flux. Uh, what you've got in purple is the net sediment flux, which is directly feeding the ocean. And uh, in uh, orange is the amount of sediment, which is actually going to be uh, stored on uh, continents for this particular uh, time. Uh, so what we've got is we've got an initial uh, let's say, uh, relatively uh, a quiet period from the Cambrian to the Silurian. Then after we've got an increase, a kind of a plateau here. And then after a drop, uh, just after the assembly of Pangaea, and then after after the breaker part of Pangaea, we start with like this increase, which basically will mimic uh, some of the main uh, mountain uh, ranges that forms during uh, uh, since, the, since the, the Triassic. Uh, and we see that the continental depositions, they start to really kick off uh, just after the, the Permian and through the Triassic, and then after they remain relatively constant over that time, over the rest of the time. So uh, what we try to do then was trying to see uh, if there is actually a, a, a relationship between the diversification of, uh, of, of marine and terrestrial life uh, and if this diversification is related to the physical environment, uh, we should be able to learn something out of these models. Uh, <laughs> so if we, so first thing we did was, well, we are not biologists, so we just took like the a number of, uh, of marine families over time. Uh, and uh, what we've got just after the, the Cambrian explosion, we've got like the, uh, we've got the, uh, go up, so the great, the great Ordovician uh, biodiversity events. Then, so after this uh, steep increase, we've got a plateau up to the you know big uh, mass extinction in the end of the Permian, and then after you've got like this uh, uh, steady increase uh, from the Triassic basically to to present day. Uh, so if we basically uh, over over, over uh, on the top of this map, we, we put our, our net sediment flux, which is delivered to the ocean. What we find is that we, we've got like a, a, this plateau, which corresponds to this, you know, the, which seems to match uh, with this, uh, this initial plateau. We've got um, uh, a, a, a decrease, which is uh, before the uh, mass extinction from the Permian. And then after we've got our increase, uh, which uh, uh, is shown here. If we do a, a, a quick correlation between the two, we find a really strong uh, uh, Pearson correlation of uh, zero point, uh, of, I mean, pretty much 0 0.9, uh, which suggests that there is a strong correlation between the two. So one, one option is that uh, this uh, strong correlation is actually uh, showing us the fact that as uh, rivers are uh, transporting uh, sediment to the ocean. They also transport uh, nutrients, which are like the the main, uh, the primary uh, 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 food for 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 organism. And that's actually uh, the fact that you've got like this change in sediment flux uh, to the ocean that will basically uh, force like the diversification of uh, of marine life. So. Also, we are aware that the fact that there is this correlation doesn't mean that it's a, 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 it's actually a, a causality. Uh, and, and we would like to think that this is, this, this is actually a causality, but at the moment, we can't really tell that. Uh, potentially, uh, the fact that we see uh, this strong, co this strong uh, uh, co person co coefficient is actually uh, because the places where we have found some fossil record is actually places where there is a lot of sediments that have been deposited and that we're able to basically uh, store these fossils. Um, in, in, so in this case, what the model is telling us is that there is like a big uh, bias in the 
in the fossil record. Uh, and potentially, what we can do is use this model to uh, find some unexplored uh, places where you you know where there is uh, some sediment accumulations that have not really been uh, looked into for for fossil data. Another thing that we can do is uh, uh, now moving from the marine uh, life to 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 the the continental life is uh, trying to evaluate how uh, this uh, uh, geomorphic uh, features that we are able to map in the model can be used to evaluate uh, uh, plant diversification. So what we did is we took some of the morphometrics from our models. So you've got like the roughness of the landscape at the top. Uh, slopes, uh, water fluxes, and we uh, categorize them uh, uh, and combine them into one single matrix that we call the physiographic index or the, physio uh, the physiographic diversity index, uh, which basically represents the complexity of the landscape in terms of, uh, of all these parameters. Um, and what we did is we, again, looked at the number of uh, species over time uh, in terms of plants uh, and tried to see if there was any uh, relationship between what the model was uh, uh, telling us uh, and, and, uh, and the evolution of, this, of these plants. Uh, so the first thing we did was mapping the total area of this endoric basin over time. Uh, and uh, in this case, I mean, that's what is quite uh, nice with uh, plants is that you've got pretty much a, a linear increase. And in our case, uh, total uh, area cover of sediments also is increasing linearly. And so we've got here again, a strong correlation uh, between, uh, between both curves. Um, and so on top of uh, the total area, which is covered by this, uh, by, by endoric basins, we also added like the component which is related to this physiographic diversity index that I talked about before. So we looked at the variability of this physiographic index over time, and we combined the total area covered by sediments with this uh, uh, physiographic uh, variability. Uh, and we end up with a uh, 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 another even stronger correlation of uh, of uh, with a R square of uh, nearly zero point nine, uh, which suggests that the, the the expansion of plants only started once we started to have uh, some um, uh, soil uh, some prop some good soil condition for the plants to start to grow and basically it, it also facilitates the development of uh, rooted uh, plants. Uh, and so the idea is that here again, there, it seems that there is a strong link between the evolution of the landscape, the transport of sediments uh, in different area, and the evolution not only of the marine life, but also of the plants. So to, conclu to, to conclude, I guess the idea is that this is still work, uh, work in, in progress. Um, our idea is to be able to uh, add the surface processes component uh, into uh, into like this global uh, uh, paleo earth system modeling framework. So there is people who have been working on mantle convection at global scale. There is this uh, uh, paleo climate models uh, and the biodiversity, which at the moment is is using these two uh, components of plate reconstruction and paleo climate. And potentially our, our goal will be to add these surface processes uh, component on top of that to see how it might help to. Uh, to evaluate biodiversity uh, over deep time. Thank you. I think uh, continue. Let me stop this. Can't see anyone. Thank you so much, Tristan, for such an um, incredibly stimulating talk. Um, so we have some time for questions. Um, you can either post a question in the chat if you like, or um, raise your hand and I'll uh, and I'll call on people. Um, an easy way to do this, you, you raise your physical hand, but I might not see it. So an easy way to do it is if you click on the reactions button on the bottom of the screen, you'll see there's a little raise hand feature is what it looks like when I do it. So I'll, I'll start out with a question then, since I see no hands up yet. Um, 
one of the things I'm I'm struck by in this, in a question that came up is, what about the role of weathering? I know it's the the weathering, both chemical and physical, of um, of the rocks that uses the sediment. Chemical weathering, of course, is implicated in drawdown of CO two. It seems to be highly sensitive to temperature and precipitation. There's this idea that when you get um, uh, like our continent collisions in the tropics, especially if there's a lot of mafic material uplifted, you have a strong CO2 drawdown effect. And weathering also will provide the nutrients that um, that drive uh, the biotic system. So have you thought about how you could incorporate um, weathering processes, which we I think it's fair to say we don't understand really well at a quantitative level, but how could you uh, think about that role in these global simulations? Uh, yeah, so there is a, um, one one way of uh, of you know, to 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 be able to start to look at that. You you need to have a, a kind of a representation of the uh, of the surface geology to some extent uh, to know what kind of rocks you are exhumating. Uh, there is some, so for example, there is this uh, uh, work from uh, Musdorf where you've got like, uh, he mapped basically the, the surface geology and he's got a kind of a, a, a coefficient of erodibility, which is varying depending on the, of the surface geology. Uh, the problem is how you integrate this uh, surface geology over time. Uh, uh, and, you know, do it, Again, I, I mean, in, in terms of like basic weathering, it's not really a problem of, uh, of uh, modeling capability. It's more a problem of how do you have the information for doing that. Uh, and that's where, that's where the, the problem is. In terms of uh, where, and I didn't mention that, but uh, you're right, one, one, one aspect that is, I think, important specifically for people who are doing paleoclimate models and because of the role that weathering is playing on CO2, uh, there is, like uh, I think, a lot of uh, things that could be learned from uh, this landscape evolution model uh, and that could be applied to this paleoclimate uh, community. Uh, and that, as you know, at the moment, most of the, uh, most, most of the ways this is uh, dealt with in paleoclimate model is based on, on box model. Uh, where you will have the distance to the mountain range, the elevation of the mountain, and from that you have a coefficient that is telling you that the amount of uh, sediment that is eroded, and and uh, and and so that's how they they basically derived this kind of information from the landscape. I think there is ways um, with this type of approach to improve on this and to go a bit further than uh, the idea of uh, of uh, of using. Uh, a box model and and it's specifically it's really important i think also when you look at the places where these sediments are distributed because like uh, when you just have like a, even like a alpha alpha meter change in your landscape this can you can have a river that goes you know from uh, two thousand kilometer uh, difference in terms of uh, where the outlet ends up so that's like there is a lot of uh, of uh, of you know things that are happening there. Um... Thanks, um, Albert Kettner. Yeah, thank you, Tristan. This was a very inspiring talk. It's just uh, I I'm thinking about you know having some sort of digital twins where you can turn off processes and see how different landscapes would evolve and and the capability with your model is just. Yeah, beyond what you can imagine, I think. Um, so that that's that's pretty cool. I I got a question about your um, improving the resolution uh, of certain landscapes, right? You you let your model you you pick it you pick a time slice, if I understand it well, yeah. and then you let your model run till it hits kind of equilibrium, right? And there, you you know. You know, but not much of the landscape will change at at this point anymore, right? But but how do you know? You know, this is kind of um, a good representation of this 
yeah, higher resolution. That's so so that's one. And then then associate the question with it. How much can you get higher in resolution before you're running into kind of you know maybe maybe not realistic uh, processes anymore where where you're not it, it's more maybe a statistical difference than really you know capturing processes uh, can you reflect a little bit on on those two uh yeah so so yeah so uh i will start maybe with the second one uh i think you're you're right there is like i mean the the resolution that we use here like one kilometer or five kilometer we use this because usually uh, uh this kind of resolution they are considered as a you know standard or even coarse resolution in landscape evolution model and we use the same kind of uh, of of laws and the ones that are uh, i mean they are like relatively coarse compared to some some models but but you know like the, the stream power law in itself should 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 work uh, well in this kind of of resolution after uh, the if we wanted we could have like uh, it's it's possible in the model to have like higher resolution in some places uh, that you are really focusing on uh, and like Corsair one, for example, in the ocean, if you you don't really simulate landscape ocean, you could like speed up your model by doing so. Um, one uh, uh, to to come back to 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 your uh, to to the problem of uh, of of, uh, of uh, yeah, is it uh, statistically representative? I think the idea is that here I just I'm just showing you know one or two simulation. Uh, in reality, like uh, like if we are using this kind of model at uh, at catchment scale, we will run like uh, potentially twenty hundreds of simulation. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Here, here we are. Even if the model can be run over uh, uh, in, on a supercomputer, we are limited in terms of uh, of uh, of uh, of, the, of model time. Uh, I mean, if we are just uh, talking about the model where we do the um, uh, the dynamic equilibrium, that's fine because we we can we are running with one time slice. So uh, and and a time slice like this at five kilometer resolution, it will take I don't know two hours, three hours to run on hundred of CPU. So you can run multiple of them. It's not really an issue, and it's not continuous in time in this case. So and that's why I guess also the paleoclimate uh, uh, people have been using this approach as well. So you map something which is representative. Uh, of uh, your specific time slice. If you start to run like the first model where I run it for 100 million years, where it's actually a continuous model, uh, this took much longer to run uh, than like running the entire Phanerozoic uh, with a time slice every 5 million years. Uh, because like you, at each time step, you have to uh, stop your model. I mean, and we have a, like an automatic process to do that, but compare with the next time step from uh, from the Scottish paleo elevation, check the mismatch, find what needs to be changed in your model. Uh, and in our case, we assume that what needs to be changed is the tectonic. Okay, we don't we don't rerun a, a paleo climate model. So we just like iterate up to the point where we reach something that is fine. Uh, but yeah, in reality, like you should, I mean, th there is a need to really like do a lot more simulation uh, to be relatively confident with what we are suggesting. But in any cases, even if, you know, there is still work to do at first, at first order, like this kind of strong relationship that we find uh, is, is quite, uh, I mean, we found it quite amazing. Uh, you know, so that that was uh, the goal really of what we did here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, cool. Thank you. Other questions for Teresa? Uh, I'm going to toss out one more, I guess, <laughs> seeing no others. Um, one of the things that struck me was that in your example from South America, you pointed to an anomaly, a place where mm -hmm. the the model was distinctly different from the evidence. Were there other notable, and I mean, that strikes, that seems like a good use of this kind of model to identify anomalies yeah. where uh, there's something that doesn't quite fit, which may point to a, a gap in our knowledge. Were there other notable anomalies that you you discovered in this process? 
Oh, many. But this Tandilia height is, is also really important for biodiversity because this is like a, splay, a place of high endemism. Uh, and so knowing this kind of things is really important. But to give you another example, like the Mississippi, for example, you know, like it was, this is one of the best studied places on Earth. Uh, but still, like it's crazy, like the amount of difference that we've got uh, in terms of where were the catchment, you know, where the like the upstream part of the Mississippi drainage, you know, it was uh, not working at all. Uh, uh, and after, like in terms of where the main uh, delta were uh, depositing, you know, that was like uh, uh, really difficult. I think every place is where. You've got uh, really uh, uh, something uh, which is relatively flat. Uh, it it takes pretty much nothing to go from uh, you know what I was saying before from an outlet that can be two kilometers, two thousand kilometers apart. Uh, like the Am the Amazon was uh, working really well. That was good. Uh, the Orange River as well. Uh, but uh, but yeah, the Mississippi was an example where it was not working. The Niger Delta as well. It was a bit problematic, and this is because uh, uh, there is like uh, I mean the way the paleogeography is 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 computed, uh, there is really a narrow kind of valleys uh, at present day where uh, this this Niger Niger River is flowing through, which is not basically possible to uh, to simulate. I mean to 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 get at uh, at the course at five or at five kilometer resolution, so you end up with something that is feeding your internal uh, internal Africa basically. So that's all these tricks where uh, you could basically uh, uh, fine tune the landscape, uh, fine tune the paleogeography to get something better. Yeah, awesome. Well, we've hit the top of the hour. Um, thank you so much, Jason. Bring up till two a.m. now in Sydney. <laughs> To share your work. I'm awake. I'm awake. The no. recording will be up in a few days um, if you want to catch it again or tell your friends. Thanks again. Thanks.